feeling better? Oh my God. <laughs> yes, I am feeling much better. I'm just tired because my dog woke me up early with a bathroom emergency. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Ken, was that last comment to me or to Jack on the email thread? Uh, it was to Jack. I didn't okay. have a chance to respond to yours because the this call was coming up. So no, that that's fine. I got all confused with Google Doc. You know, responding through Google and through me, whatever. <laughs> yeah, let me see what you said. No, no, I agreed with you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I thought it was really fascinating that you know they did this experiment on social media when people didn't know that they were talking to the opposite political party. Learning soared, and as soon as they evoked, you know, Republicans, Democrats plummeted. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to the Annenberg School um, website on YouTube and their channel, and pulled up a bunch of videos of his, as well as there's a long one. It's about uh, 60 minutes long. I haven't had a chance to watch it. Hey, Todd. Um, Hello. Just fascinated by this idea of of one of them was talking about um, groupthink versus collective intelligence and. So they ran an experiment where they'd ask people how many jelly beans in this jar or how many calories in this, um, uh, this meal. And people had a chance individually to say their guess, and they had three chances and their guesses didn't get any better. Then they allowed them to talk to other people where everybody was equal and they'd show the average number of guesses. And after three times, guesses got much more accurate as to whether or not they were correct. And then they ran the experiment with a thought leader centered in, you know, okay, I'm the, I'm, I'm the guy, I'm the expert, right? And again, collective intelligence went down. So there's something about the equality of speaking with people with no one person having any hierarchy or, or you know, uh, expertise above the others that leads to collective intelligence. And this is very important for my work as somebody who tries to evoke collective intelligence in organizations. So I got to do some more research on this. I'll probably end up buying his book, um, but I'm just fascinated by the, the whole approach. Hey, Stuart. Hi, guys. Morning. Morning. Welcome. Or afternoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we've got a couple of people for whom it's afternoon. And if Mila shows up, it'll be evening for her. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So, um, how is everybody? Good. Just started Good. snowing here. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's really pretty. Mm. I haven't looked out my window yet. I guess it's not. <laughs> I guess it will be coming here if it's not yet. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you're you're west of me, so probably hit you first. Um, but yeah, Stuart, it's where, just one, those big, huge flakes that are that are gorgeous. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. What time? Where is Stuart? Where are you? I'm home planet. in Al Alameda, California. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And I went to the, um, I don't know if anybody has seen the Banksy exhibit. Not yet. I saw it yesterday at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco, mm. which, I, which I never really kind of walked around. I always just went inside to events. Wow, what a gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Uh, what a gorgeous, amazing, co amazing complex. But anyway, the first thing when you walk into Banksy, the Banksy exhibit, there's a... Uh, one of his his slogans and the slogan is think outside the box collapse the box and take a fucking sharp knife to it <laughs> <laughs> love that which i, I just go for think outside period right <laughs> which so I it's the banksyexhibit.com mm -hmm. And then San Francisco is the uh, the current one, but Banksy exhibit is the art of Banksy. It's a private collection, unauthorized yeah. private collection. Yeah. So mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um, Wait, unauthorized? You mean like anonymous? Anonymous? Well, don't, don't, don't know who it's by, but um, there's all this Banksy's, Banksy's working irony, like Andy Warhol was working yeah. irony. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, unauthorized private collection, okay. whatever, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If yeah. there are any Simpsons fans here, I just put a link to the Banksy opening for the Simpsons, which if you haven't seen is really hysterical and heartbreaking at the same time. Uh, so I'm a big Simpsons fan. Uh, yes. And I had the bank. That's I had that one before as well. Yeah. I was drag kicking and streaming into the Simpsons. I resisted for years thinking it was really stupid. And then. My wife had a colleague at work who collected them all and she brought home the 
the you know the, the first season and i was hooked inside of 10 minutes i was like okay this is <laughs> this is awesome <laughs> i tried to watch futurama thinking i would love it and then like just stalled out right away so i yeah. I, I think i just didn't give it enough time or something but but yeah groaning is pretty pretty genius about humor and and i like their humor a lot more than i like other other approaches so if um, you're if you like guillermo del toro uh troll hunters tales of arcadia is really great um it's dreamworks does the animation so it's like really high quality animation and it's just a great story of um teenage boys uh and trolls and and teenage girls and and how they have to work together as a team i mean you know there's a fat kid there who gets gets brought in and treated as an equal and becomes a superhero I and mean, it's really a lovely lovely story and it's just a fun uh use a palette as a palette cleanser after i've watched something dark and and disturbing i have to go and find something to you know before i go to sleep sort of clear my mind put a little yeah. mm -hmm. you know and that is one thing about ken he does like some dark stuff <laughs> yeah you saw my my google sheet yeah <laughs> Well, I think we should probably start. I don't know if Mila's going to join us or not. Um, so thoughts about uh, the last episode? Well, first, my the version I saw was all messed up. Uh, yes. The video didn't sync with the audio. The, the mm -hmm. video said it was two hours long, but it really was only an hour long. Yeah. So I basically moved it to the side, forgot the video entirely, and just listened to it like a podcast. And that was OK. But that was disconcerting and got me in a bad place. Mm -hmm. And then I found it kind of a mishmash. I found it less organized and less, less interesting than the other two. Mm -hmm. I had the same experience uh, watching, you know, them speak and other people are on the screen saying things and I'm hearing Helene's voice and there's, you know, there's this guy there and it just, it was very, very confusing. So like you, I just basically listened and didn't really pay much attention to the screen. Um, anybody else? Uh, Stuart, go ahead. Yeah, and that that and that being said, it still stimulated a whole bunch of thinking on my part in terms of, um, you know, it, once again, the information wasn't new, and some of the suggestions of, of things that we could do weren't new, but the time is different, and you know, maybe it's more um, there's a quickening going on now in terms of people's realization, and so I started, you know, kind of clicking off. Um, how to have a just a massive campaign and this morning when I was out walking I thought of um, um, I don't know if anybody some of you probably remember you know Lady Bird Johnson's um, campaign to to clean up the trash all over the you know the interstate highways I mean you know growing up in the 50s you just throw trash out your out your car windows and on a family trip it was just you know de rigueur and she started this whole campaign and so yeah it's time to clean up the heat on the planet um to to, to lessen global warning warming and just the the notion of having some mass campaign to to do that um you know unfortunately it's probably going to involve shutting down the airlines or something 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 like that until you know um the technologies that are developed and that um, that are sustainable. Mm -hmm. So that's where I went with the episode. Mm -hmm. Ken and I had a conversation this week about the golden age of television um, that we're in. Neither of us own a television, but we watch shows. Um, and the how much great storytelling there is and and the production value is so high on so many things that i'm spoiled that i i feel like um the anecdotes the content the overall arc are all good but i'm spoiled by amazing storytelling and i wonder how much different it would get to the heart of all of us if there was music, if there were great visuals, if there were not talking heads, if there was not informal language, but scripted and, and delivered with voice talent. And so that's, it's kind of hard to judge, like, how is this? Because like you said, Stuart, this, it's not new information. Um, the power of the storytelling can, the, can go way up. 
so Todd, you're saying that the production quality would improve and it would increase the power? Production quality and uh, the narrative formation. So, you know, I signed on to this partly because of the people who are offering it, um, both the people who are creating it and the people who are in this group. Um, but I also, what resonated with me is facts don't change people's minds. And yet I have gotten a lot of facts. I mean, that's facts plus anecdotes delivered in a highly personal way, um, but it was mostly facts. So I think moving from facts to storytelling is you go beyond the research, let's research and collect and, and organize and have people who are experts at crafting something. Um, so I, so I'm, I'm really on both sides of that. I'm really mixed on it because for me, historically, production value has been inverse often to emotional connection. That things that look authentic and immediate are much more interesting than things that are highly polished. I'm a big fan of the Dogma 95 cinema movement started by Lars, Lars von Trier and some renegade Danish directors who were like, when they bring in the violins to cue you to start crying, that's manipulation and that's not good. And so Dogma 95 was like, hey, there's a movie and here's some rules, the, the, the vow of charity, the vow of chastity, which are like, how are you gonna shoot movies? So on the one hand, and then also I come out of the newsletter business. I used to write a tech industry newsletter where intentionally most of my peer newsletters looked like they were typed even though that we were no longer using IBM Selectrix. There'd be a Selectric font and a couple of the editors of the newsletters were famously like, leave a couple typos in. It makes it look like it just hot off the presses, right? Mm -hmm. All that said, storytelling is king, judicious use of narrative and all these other kinds of things is fab fa fabulous well thought through crafted thinking or story arc or something like that is really important. And, and to me, that's different from production value. You could have, yeah. you could have three amateurs sort of just voicing something with a great narrative. And I'd be like totally in there. Um, and then, and then you have things like this, Annie Leonard's story of stuff, which went viral back some years ago um, and was a beautifully rendered drawn, you know, person standing in, in line drawing, uh, rendition of hey look at look at all this crap we're generating and what happens to it and how it ends up in the waste bin and that worked really really well so I'm kind of on both sides of that and and I get suspicious when production value goes up so Jason Silva's shots of awe I just roll my eyes like when I watch anything Jason Silva does mostly it's so overproduced and has so many like here's a galaxy here's a here's an atom here's a baby ah uh, can't you can you believe it but it appeals to some people and that's cool, right? But, but his is like on the overproduced side where I'm like, man, right. can you just like rein right. that sucker in a little bit? Uh, you might actually be really powerful because uh, he's so that's, passionate. Yeah, I, that's interesting that there is the line in which authenticity uh, wanes if, if, if the intent is to manipulate. I don't know if that is the line itself, but the intent is to communicate versus manipulate. And I, I, now I want to go back and watch other stuff and see how I feel. This is Stacy. So this is a yes and comment. Um, because, I mean, I agree better production value would have really helped a lot. But there's another part of me that says, and we are the story that continues. So Todd, you had dropped off the last call and I thought to myself, so what can we do to bring this forward? For me, there's so much value in this kind of a meeting. So I suggested that we host one of our own. And when I went out last night, I, um, there was a couple that I've met them a few times, but I didn't know them well. And I was talking to my girlfriend. I was just telling her about you know, my day. And the one woman heard me talk about this. She was like, oh, could you share that? I want to do it because my sister. And I said to her, you know, they're raising money to, um, you know, get better pr production value. And then when I do it, I'll invite you. And I know that when I have, when I convene that gathering, there's going to be all different types of people there. Um, and that's part of the beauty in it. So, 
again, I really, I've said it from the beginning, the minute Ken posted this, I really love this idea for a number of different reasons. Um, maybe if I were doing it, I'd only show episode two, which starts with the animals. And, you know, if I were doing it, because I know the kind of people I'd have. Um, for you know, people that are already totally involved in the environmental movement, maybe not so much. It's not. It's it, that's not the purpose. Wendy, did you have a reaction you want to share with us? Um, yeah. Um, thanks, Ken. Uh, trying to build on what other people are saying because I agree with with everything that's been shared so far. Um, I think. For me too, I was looking back at the three episodes um, and Stacy, what you were just saying too, I almost feel like I, I want a second version, <laughs> right? Like yeah. for people who have been thinking about this for a long time, but maybe are out of touch with the science. Like, so the first one I, I still think has had, I think all three of them had value for me, but I would love to see the first one redone with a whole added deeper layer or going further or somehow with an understanding that the audience has heard, you know, the basics before. And so can, can we use that hour to push it a little further? Same thing with the second, same thing with the third. Um, I especially felt like this third one was very much geared towards people who hadn't thought about this anymore, you know, really before. And it was I thought worded very well in the sense that it was very welcoming and saying that you could start anywhere, right? You start with the things that excite you, um, start with the things that, you know, are just in your neighborhood or whatever. It doesn't have to be big and then see how it grows. I, I liked that they did that. I think so much of what we have been shown through media has been more shock and awe and trying to um, get and, and, and ending off in a place that that basically communicates, this is a big problem, needs a big solution. And then everybody's like, well, oh, well, like, I guess there's nothing I can do about that. So I think um, their, their invitation to start small and not worry about the big picture, I think was really, really smart. However, I would like to be in a place and, and would love our group to go to that place if we want to um, of, okay, so now what for those of us that are that have been thinking about this for a long time, right? Where, where can we insert ourselves? And I'm also a person that hates, um, yeah, like I guess <laughs> hates is the right word. I was catching myself and I'm like, no, I kind of, I hate when things are, when, when energy is wasted. So when I see the same thing happening in 16 different places and the struggle with trying to start something new 16 times over versus people combining efforts um, or sharing best practices. So that's where I'm living right now is trying to provide a framework in which people can share best practices so that we're not repeating things. And even though my goal isn't, isn't climate change specific, oh boy, is it back there from my perspective that it's always urging me forward, you know, um, but it's not, again, I'm hoping that what I'm, the project I'm working on is not just going to help us with climate change. It'll help with everything else, which also helps with climate change. Like I, you know, to me, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not specific. So I'm looking at more meta. I feel like this group is a little more meta and it would be nice to kind of talk about it from that perspective. I, I do have a suggestion when we're ready to move into, um, this thing I got from a friend who used to work at IDEO of, uh, a way of critiquing of, I liked, I wish, I wonder. But I just wanted to sort of start with reactions and where people are having watched it. So um, if at some point you want to start going into what, what um, Jerry and Todd are getting into of, you know, I really like this about this. I really wish they had done this. And I wonder what would happen if they if they you know thought about it from this perspective. That's a, a way to um, uh, sort of move into a, a different sort of conversation but i just wanted to stay with the overall feeling tone of you know are you happy that you that you watched it um i'm certainly happy i've been part of this group i mean i love you, all of you you're lovely wonderful people and it's been a pleasure and privilege to be with you and i i came away with a lot of mixed feelings um you know part of me is like i actually thought they didn't um and now i'm getting into the critique of, i i didn't think they did enough to stimulate a sense of urgency um, that, that land, that did not really land well for me. I don't, and maybe it's cause I've been on this for over 30 years and I've, I've really faced down some very bleak and dark things about it, but I felt I could have been a lot more, um, there. And I, I also thought, um, 
Todd was pointing to this, they relied too much on data and science. And there was this wonderful man on one of the OGM calls recently. Uh, is it Richard from they retired from the EPA? Mm -hmm. And he's telling this story, he goes, you know, and there's this guy and he stands up and he puts his thumbs in his suspender and goes, well, that's all fine, but I don't believe in science, you know, and what do we do to reach those people who don't believe in science, um, which really seems to be missing from this. So uh, Richard Hammond, yeah, I hope he keeps coming back. He's terrific mm -hmm. to listen to. He's lovely. That, that, that even sounded like him, Ken. That was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, from an emotional well, and, and standpoint, I would I think there could have been much more impact to carry me along and take me out of my critiquing mind, but just pull me in, tell me a great story. I don't care so much. I love good production values, but you know, you could have very simple drawings, uh, like the story of stuff, right? Which were very line drawings. You know, didn't need, you know, huge cost a lot of money to make. Yes, I'm sure it did. Um, Unfortunately. So, but, you know, as something like Doodle, you could probably do do that fairly easily, yeah. you know. So um, I also would have really liked more thoughtful engagement. There was a lot of telling and not a lot of showing and not a lot of think about this. You know, they asked you think about somebody who's going to be how old they'll be in 2050, some child that you're in your life. But or you, if you're if you're a younger person or if you're me, it's probably going to be, you know, Ash. Um, but how do we how can we present this in a way that really evokes deep thinking in people and maybe stop and have this conversation if you're doing this in a group pause the tape you know talk about this what's what's this evoking in you what does it what does it mean to you um, I think that would have been much more powerful for me if that had been part of the invitation so um, I think it would be useful for all of us to have um, perspective on this this was Admittedly, I don't know if they said it, but it's obvious this was an amateur uh, <laughs> creation. Yeah. It's, a, it's an amateur creation, but we all know the message is a critical one for right now. And so what can we give them by way of feedback to bump it up such that it would have real value and, and real usefulness? Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's, there, there's um, the idea of kind of a homey message uh, woven with some things with great high production values could be an effective um, mechanism and presentation. I'm sure that, that there are lots of people out there who would volunteer uh, time and effort to produce something um, that could have broad impact. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I agree about this. Uh, I agree about the the um, the science piece. It's almost like you know <laughs> a message saying, you know, it really isn't too late. It really isn't too late with a you know a few um, documented punching points of what's what is still possible at this at this moment in time. Something to kind of cut through um, all of the noise. Um, that's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Ken, I think you mentioned that something that'll reach different markets, that'll reach different people who are on different stages of um, awareness, engagement. Um, yeah. So, so it's a good start in some sense, but it's a first draft. Yeah. You know? I, I think that was Wendy actually talking about the different people, but yeah, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Stuart, thanks, thanks for bringing us back to, hey, this was an amateur production on purpose and, and we're holding it up <laughs> to a much higher standard, partly because it's being it's being promoted or disseminated a lot as, hey, let's get groups together and do this. So at that point, some of the ante goes up, but, but clearly yeah. that was like where they started. Mm -hmm. um, it reminded me a little bit, uh, some guy mentioned early, uh, a couple of years ago, he said, when, when old people get together, the first thing they do is often, he calls it the organ recital. <laughs> and, my, and my kidney's been acting up and like you know my my left Play foot, my kishka's and my kishka's like malfunctioning and i just I, had my left rheostat replaced and i don't know it's just not working right and it, and it felt like episode one was the organ recital of earth mm. there's microplastics and everything and the uh, ice sheets are melting although i'm not sure they got there they didn't touch ocean acidification mm -hmm. they, they touched a bunch of crises but it was it was a litany of crises which all of us are very familiar with i think mostly and i would have loved gene bellinger or christina bowen just on the side with a kumu map 
-hmm. connecting those things and showing how some of these things tip other things into hypervelocity and unexpected yes. places. And a, a little animation of, you know, you're in this valley over here and suddenly you sort of tip out of this valley and you're like uh, on a roller coaster to good, who knows where, because the systems once they tip are unstable and wind up in, 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 in other configurations you can't really predict and blah, blah, a couple things like that. I don't know, uh, sort of systems mapping, systems thinking, systems flow diagramming, but at, a, but at a, a level that's really accessible. And I'm not sure who does that best, but I wanted some of that. And then episode three seemed like, well, you could buy nothing new. And there's a couple of people who did the buy nothing new thing and published about it and all that, show their articles or point to them. Um, but there I was like, you know, it'd be really handy to have a great long list. Uh, the thing I wrote down uh, from that part of the episode was, uh, join a local chapter of a global movement that seems to be doing some good. Mm -hmm. Cool. Give me a list. Yeah. Like, let, let's, let's make a nice big shared list. Like, like, you know, Vincent is doing with Trove or, or, or Wendy would like to have on the tapestry or whatever, but, but let's have, let's have a list of good places and chapters. And I actually think that those chapter conversations are really interesting and important. And then, and then, one thing that we started with here that's just jumping out at me is the, the Damon Santola video, Ken, that you shared with us, which is when you attach political labels to the conversation, suddenly collective intelligence just plunges. Um, and, and I mentioned at the start of this when our, in our first conversation a couple of days ago that if they don't touch the politics of this and what's going on, I'll be really dismayed. And I am, I'm totally dismayed that, that none of the, the sort of mind hacking that's going on that's keeping us from addressing these things wasn't, wasn't addressed. But I'll say that the Centola video, which I watched just before this, um, made me think, oh, I kind of, was, I wasn't thinking about this very deeply, but I was kind of thinking, how can the progressive ideas about how to fix this win? And I wasn't thinking, man, Democrats and, and Republicans are both really fucked up, a, a belief I have. Um, and how can we step out of political references and frames to solve these things together in like intelligent ways? But I, I wasn't stepping outside of the political frames enough in my head. And I think that's mm. useful. Mm. Yeah, it, 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 what's important, I think, and they didn't hit this, is to very cogently make the case, you know, here are the, here are the benefits, you know, here, here are the potential benefits, boom, 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 boom. Um, and they're all there, you know, the economic benefits, the, the, the planetary benefits, caring about your, your, your descendants, um, you know, the food sources, the healthier, I mean, it's just, it, it, the litany is just, is just amazing, you know, versus um, we want to keep on going the way we're going because this is the uh, way of life. This is the, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, it, that can be done hitting all those pieces and, and they need to hit those, you know, th those need to be um, stated clearly. Mm -hmm. With, with as, as some, Todd, I think you mentioned earlier, the notion of um, people aren't persuaded by facts, they're persuaded by stories. And you can have all kinds of different stories for, in each one of those areas, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm reminded several years ago, Reuters did a series on rising seas and they did not use any um, satellite photos or anything. They used tide records. Now people in, keeping records of tides for like 150, 170 years, right? And, you know, I, I grew up around the water and there's a high tide marker and a low tide marker, you know, and, and you know, we can tie your boat here on low tide and tie it up here on high tide. And, and so there's this woman who, I think it's around 2014 or so, she's a tea partier. She's uh, a, a county supervisor and she's standing on the dock of her, sitting at near the dock of her family home on Chesapeake Bay. She goes, I don't believe in global warming, but I can't deny the fact that my dock is underwater, right? <laughs> that is irrefutable. <laughs> it's like evidence-based, you know? And so that's the kind of thing to invite people to say, what has changed in your life? You know, as you look over your, your own experience, what evidence do you see that things are getting better and what evidence do you see that things are, are in, in crisis and how does that make you feel and what do you want to do about it you know those to me would be really potent questions to pose can you just hit a, a um kind of a critical point um 
when you quoted her as saying, I don't believe. No, 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 no. This is, this is not a question of whether you believe in it or not. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the science here. Um, really briefly, many years ago, I had a project in Los Angeles for, I don't know, three months, something like that. And we were in Oakwood Apartments uh, and the client was in the Century City Twin Towers. And so we would drive up, I think it was Olympic Boulevard or something like that every day. And one day there was a big rain shower and it never rains in LA, but there was a big rain shower. And that day we did the same commute, which we've been doing now for a couple months up to um, the Twin Towers. And right there between the Twin Towers of Century City was the Hollywood sign. Like right there, crisp as you want. And I was like, hmm, that's been there the whole time, I'm pretty sure. I don't think they moved it or it suddenly popped up. And then we went up to our floor and looked around and you could see airplanes landing at, at LAX and taking off. And they looked like, like wee little ants and you could see every wrinkle in the hills and, and everything had been washed off and cleaned and polished and the air was crystal and it was, it was incredible. You know, and, and one of the things I felt long ago was for people who doubt man-made climate change, just take them to the edge of one of the major cities that's all polluted. Take them to the edge of Bangkok, Mexico City, Los Angeles, or whatever, and have them stand on, a normal, on an average day, New Delhi, have them stand on a, Beijing on an average day and just look around and say, like, <laughs> like, this stuff isn't infinite. It doesn't just blow away. We're doing this kind of now at a global scale. And, and doesn't that bother you, right? Because there's just really practical things that are happening that are at hand um, that, are, that, that illustrate this really well. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I just want to point out that it's not even just about the people that don't believe in climate change. We passed that point. There are people that believe it's happening, believe it can't be stopped, and are okay with that because that's part of God's will. There's a there are other so so it's like this, it's this acceptance. So again, to emphasize how much value I think there is in convening people that you're loosely related to. It changes, you know, we had a thread, a, a vegan thread, and I shared a story about how um, there was a restaurant and it would have these vegan nights. And even though I wasn't vegan, I went, it was a social experience and, you know, it became like a fun thing to do. And it changed the attitudes that people had because not everybody that went there was vegan and nobody was shamed for not being vegan. So getting people to do things for different reasons, it doesn't matter what their reason is, as long as they change their behavior. So I'm saying maybe it's not so important, you know, to keep fighting over, like they don't care about the science. So why do we keep trying to reach them on the science? They told us they don't care. Why aren't we listening to what they're telling us? So I just want to share that. A very well, good question. <laughs> I think actually Ken too, it, we're, um, okay, like 10 thoughts. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, Stuart first reacting to your question about like, maybe we can give them feedback on, on how to make it better. And Stacy just talking about, you know, why are we trying to reach them? You know, and, and these people who don't want, you know, with science, who's saying that science isn't working. Um, right. And well, what was my thought? So the tipping point, I think there's multiple paths here, right? And so this goes back to kind of my comment about wanting different videos for different audiences, different sets of videos. And um, that's, that's a bigger production. So to keep it simpler, even just them sharing things like the article, Ken, that you just shared with us about the tipping point, right? That's in, there's something about that kind of thing that's inspirational right? It helps people know, especially towards the end, hey, little things do make a difference, right? It's, we're not trying to get to some, and, and I guess that's the comment I was trying to make either last time we met or the time before that, where I was saying, you know, I'm at a place where I'm actually not even interested anymore in talking to the people who aren't already interested in doing something. I think there are so many people who are interested in doing something and just don't know what to do that there's, we've got, I'd be very surprised if we didn't, according to the poll, nationwide polls, I'd be very surprised if we didn't already have the percentages that we needed to make change. People just, it's the friction to the change that's the issue. And I don't think the, 
the, our issue, even with the friction is that it's the people who don't believe in it. I, I think that was a major friction point before. I don't think that's our major friction point now. What I'm seeing, and again, I'm thinking more meta here, is a, a, for a lot of the people doing a lot of little things around um, are looking to take all that stuff to the next step right and and coordinate maybe regionally or across communities or you know things like that and and i think that that's there's a lot of friction right there um and so yeah but that's of course people who know the stuff i'm working on would know <laughs> that's my perspective that's i also recognize that's my perspective on things so whether it's helping an individual just start to get involved or it's helping people who are already involved get more involved, connect with each other, share best practices, or it's helping people that have entire organizations or entire have have shifted their entire business around, or right to hear those stories from people who have actually done the work. That goes back to what you guys were saying in terms of like hearing the stories. I think those are the stories I would like most to hear because they're inspirational. Less about, oh my God, the crisis part, although I'm okay with that too, but I'd love to hear more about what's working well. What have people done that's worked well? And then, and to, right, and you see how that like could shift people from an individual action, oh, that kind of worked for me, to a community action, to a more global and orchestrated and integrated work. Um, it seems to me that a lot of this is about retellable star stories. Um, I, if only autocorrect wouldn't stop me from, from writing that down in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll type it in once I'm done. But um, <laughs> year, years ago, Dave Witzel, his wife Claudia and I visited a, renew, a regenerative farm north of outside of Sebastopol in, uh, in California. It was lovely. I learned a ton of stuff. And one of the stories I've told multiple times was about the time a couple of years earlier where uh, uh, Elizabeth Kaiser, I think, I think it was Paul and Elizabeth Kaiser, the owners of Singing Frogs Farm, uh, she was, uh, there was a really big storm outside and uh, she got a call from her neighbor and her neighbor's like, uh, things are flooding. We're going to have to harvest right now. Do you need any help? They, they, they were offering sort of help. And she was sitting by the fire, like reading because their, their plot of land was absorbing water, like blub, 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 mm -hmm. blub. Thank you so much. This is delicious. And they were not in any flooding threat. And they were like right next door. Um, and she's like, uh, we're, we're doing okay. Thank you. We, we don't need that help. But also we're not having that crisis you're having because our soil <clears throat> has actually been remediated. And, and look, looky, I'm sitting here by the fire reading a magazine. Um, and that really stuck with me because, because those firsthand stories carry, and they're simple. They're just really simple, but they illustrate the multiple benefits of soil regeneration, soil fertility, what have you, right? Um, Anyway, I, I think that lots of nuggets, you know, if story core kind of things were available for these kinds of stories over and over and over and over, lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat, let's drop those on TikTok and Twitter and whatever. Like, like in, instead of, hey, here's the toast I had for breakfast and watch me do a really asinine dance. Well, one of the things that dismays me, you said earlier, you hate wasted energy. Um, I was on a call a month ago about Axie Infinity and NFT gaming and all that kind of stuff. And it broke my heart that a third of the population of the Philippines is busy playing a stupid ass game that pits axolo fake axolotls against each other so that they can earn a little bit more money than they might earn turking on Amazon because they're trying to feed their families because pandemic lockdown has blown up their jobs. And, and never mind that NFTs burn insane amounts of energy out in the real world, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, just heartbreaking. And I was like, could we please bend all of these different technologies and things that we have towards some good? And, 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 and when I see the, 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 and I realize, you know, the cute cat theory of internet censorship says you need to have all the junk stuff on there so that when the, the dictator cuts off your internet, everybody gets mad. Um, but could we like raise the level of conversation just a wee bit and tell some of these stories, for example? You know, I, I like that they um, talked about the story of more. I thought that was a nice catchy phrase, the story of more that really mm -hmm. resonated well. And I kept waiting for what's the story of less or what's the next line? What's the, what comes after the story of more that is attractive that's gonna pull me into wanting to make this change? So I, I think that would be, Another thing that that goes into the retellable stories, right? Of um, 
I'm reading Teeming right now by Tamsin Willie Barker, and I highly, highly recommend it. God, it's a fun read. She's just a lovely writer. And, you know, she asked the question, how do you compound infinite wealth on a finite planet? And, you know, nature's really good at this. It's been doing it for billions of years. And the way that superorganisms work and are successful is they are always focused on the next generation. And I think that's a part of the story that's missing here is if we can reclaim our connection to the next generation, to supporting, you know, and ensuring that they have what they need to be successful, um, it will shift things dramatically. And to that end, I often, you know, Jerry's heard me say this before, but, you know, I was in a living room in Marin County in 1990 or 1991 when I first heard about the seven generations and, you know, I thought, well, how the hell does anybody think 140 years ahead? A generation is 20 years, seven generations out. That's 140. Who can think 140 years out? And then I, I learned that um, the seven generations does not mean 140 years in the future. It means right now that if a person uh, lived a good life, they'd know seven generations. They'd know their great-grandparents, their grandparents, their parents, their siblings, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. And there's always seven generations walking through time. So you always take into account voices from every of those, every one of those generations in your decisions. And we've gotten away from that. So how can we, um, what's the invitation to bring people back into thinking about how do we ensure the success of the next generation? Our success has already been assured. And we, you know, we're here, we, we've got all this, these resources. Now we have to figure out how to um, leave the legacy of translating all of what we've accumulated and, and come to know both, both tangible wealth and intangible wealth into the success of the next generation. To me, that feels like a really powerful story. Kind of a nonpartisan story too. Uh, I think of uh, Golda Meir saying to, I don't remember who it was at the time, but, you know, it might have been Yasser Arafat, um, you know, I can forgive us for not wanting to work with each other, but I cannot forgive us if we allow our grandchildren to grow up hating each other, something along those lines, you know, we've got to be investing in, in the generations that are coming up behind us. And when we allow corporations with enormous uh, wealth and power to disconnect and and simply serve themselves. We've signed our own death warrant. So I'm I'm curious. What are you know? We all kind of came into this with some thoughts about what we were hoping to gain from it, and um, I'm now curious at the other end. What are people hoping to leave with today? What were they hoping? Did they kind of get what they came for, and what? Are they hoping next steps? When we sign off, what are we <laughs> today? What are we hoping to have gained or to want to continue? And I have not answered that question for myself, which is why I'm not speaking yet. Well, <laughs> I've, I've go got, first. I got what I want. I, I wanted the chance to hang out with you all and, you know, <laughs> deepen the relationships. Because <laughs> um, Jerry, I've, I know very well, Stuart less so. Wendy and I have worked it a little bit. She's helped me edit some things. Stacy is new to my life. Todd is new. I just wanted the chance to hang out with people that I know have sharp minds and soft hearts, which is my favorite combination, right? Okay. So that's been really fulfilling for me. I also wanted a chance to look at how are people like Frederick Lalu, who I have great respect for, and Helene, who I did not know until this, how are they framing this and what are they doing to, to put this out in the world? Because mm -hmm. it's been something that's been a part of my life now since about 1987, 88. So 35 years, right? Um, and or is that 45, not 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> Don't make myself older. So I feel informed um, in that regard of, okay, this is how they're going about it. I can see some real utility and some great value in this. And I can see ways to improve it. And I do want to give them some feedback. Um, and I was hoping to have a greater emotional attachment to this, but I'm fairly neutral about it. Like this didn't really jazz me, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, it's, yeah, so, so. Um, but but I, I'm really happy with the fact that we did watch it, that we all got together and talked about it. And so it, from that perspective, I feel terrific. Yeah, I, I, I would echo uh, Ken's thoughts. And, and I would add, um, in some ways, I've been sitting in um, 
well, there is no real hope <laughs> around mm -hmm. around the climate issue that that you know um so i'm going to spend the rest of my days you know doing other kinds of work um and if i can make a contribution in this area in some way i will but it's not going to be on the in the in the forefront and yet in some ways this is um uh, it's it it's reengaged me because it is it is so important it is so critical um and and it, it's got me thinking about you know what what i might do um in this in this area um and and this is an important thing not to let you know i mean you can't let it drop out um but it doesn't seem forefront if you look at the you know political discussion it's not forefront uh, and yet it's just such a foundational piece. Um, how can we, how can we kind of um, elevate it in the political discourse as the quintessential questions of our generation? Mm -hmm. We created the mess and how are we gonna, uh, uh, in some ways leave behind at least a path, at least a path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um for me because i'm compulsive about doing these kinds of things i've been I've wait been... wait wait it's been 45 minutes and we've not seen the brain <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Been... We, haven't had a, we haven't had a look at jerry's brain Actually, for 45 minutes <laughs> he, it was there before you guys came on <laughs> i figured you guys oh, were all hungry for it and i should deliver <laughs> um so this is today's group discussion. This is the video. And these are the things, you know, I pointed to Urban Gleaning and Ray Anderson and Buy Nothing New and the Bystander Effect, which they mentioned. But each of our, each of our conversations actually has its own link. And here is the video that I uploaded for our call two days ago. And the first one is up here. And, and these are all the things that we've been sort of pulling together. And underneath are the things that we sort of said uh, that are new or might be interesting. So, so so for me, and I'm doing this now habitually with any interesting call or group, um, I feel like I am kind of adding some bits to the fungus, uh, the big fungus that I talk about curating. And I wish I could connect this to other people's bits of the fungus. So I'm, I'm going to share a link right now to that. To, to the, Here's the link to today's call uh, in my brain. And it feels to me like when I do that, I'm contributing to some kind of solution over time. And the insights, so, so the thing I related a moment ago about the, uh, the video that, that Damon's video, that sort of Damon Santola's video that clicked in place, oh, partisanship, I haven't been thinking enough about partisanship sipping out of that. that. That's personally for me, a little tiny piece of the puzzle of how to step into this better and what to do. And if I can manifest that in this little funny fungus map, that's good because then it's shareable outside to other people uh, somehow. And then the question is, how do, we, how do we get these stories told? How do we propagate the memes? How do we get these hundreds of different communities that are thirsty to solve these problems to link arms loosely and define each other? Because in aggregate, they're probably over 25% of the population already, but they don't know each other. They can't find each other. They don't know where to link arms. And we don't want one big green political party that everybody joins. That's not going to work. At least that's my belief now. It, this, it, it, as soon as this degenerates to politics and it becomes, I won the vote, you lost the vote, we have, pol we have control over, this, over the, the governmental rudder, it degenerates and you get the stupid ass Mexican standoff we have right now across the world, not just in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for me, for me the, the benefit here, the progress was getting a bunch of insights and then weaving them into something durable even if obscure, uh, even if extremely obscure, uh, but, but durable that I can sort of put back out there, lather, rinse, repeat, and maybe someday uh, we figure out how all these things fit. And maybe someday my little web of, of insights connects up with Christina Bowen's web of insights, connects up with uh, you know, some Rome users' web of insights, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, just, just briefly, uh, yesterday, Ken and I were on a call with, uh, a woman named um, Ayelet Barron. And, and one of the things that Ayelet mentioned um, was 
the number of people planetary why planet wide who are actually in this conversation already and the word tipping point was used earlier um in this in, in our dialogue today and i'm just wondering you know where we are on that edge of 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 tipping point um we may be closer than 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 we think mm -hmm. um, so you know that's that's kind of the 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 piece of good news as you weave pieces that you come across you know in your life Stacey. To that to that point, and going back to the Damon video, the way I had answered Ken in the email was to say that I'd been telling my people on Facebook for a long time that if the media just removed the labels under the different Congress people they were talking to, there would be a lot of alignment. So um, I think we are closer to that tipping point. And to answer the question of what I got out of this, so for me, this was I don't see us as the intended audience. That being said, aside from wanting to meet you, what I'm always looking towards is how does collaboration start? So I was kind of looking at us as the experiment. What's going to happen as a result of our coming together? What might sprout? And it might not be directly related, but it's all related. So that that's what so I, i'm very pleased that i did this <laughs> yeah that I'm, I'm gonna hold on to that quote stacy it might not be directly related but it's all related <laughs> that's <laughs> that's fitting um yeah the i've i've reaped benefits this week um partly feeling connected to you all um partly being immersed in and something a little bit for a little while just shifts my internal orientation towards the whole topic. Yeah. So it's, um, I feel energized in that way. Uh, like you can, like I was expecting like an emotional um, whack. And so I think part of it was the expectation of, of that, that whack never coming. And now I'm, I'm realizing, well, I've been taking a thousand whacks over the last 10 years and one whack is not going to do it um i'm also i'm always curious and about movement building and i think that there's a lot more wisdom collectively right now after black lives matter uh after the last five and ten years that we've gone through that movements are not singular. Um, it's more than having a meme and an organization, um, that there is an energy to a movement that is beyond description or measurement. And I, I, I think we might be close to that tipping point. I think that movement is happening. We're just used to seeing things like categorized and packaged. Um, and I, I, I'm reaching the point where I, I don't even perhaps want that to happen, that perhaps this is so organic and maybe even consciousness led that um, it's going to happen. And then all of a sudden we're going to realize it's happening. We're going to look back one day and realize that for the last two years, we've been living in some shifted reality that's hopefully mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. the, one of the things that they repeated, I think, is a is a is a myth is no one saw the collapse of the Soviet Union coming. Perhaps um, none of the media saw that, but I know people who are involved in the citizen diplomacy movement back in the 80s with Russia, and they certainly saw it. And a number of uh, analysts working inside the intelligence community saw it. So I think we need to be really careful about the stories that we spread of, you know, what we actually know about and what we don't. Um, and I, th I think that we're um, based on it, like the video I sent this morning about the, or the Yes Magazine, the 25% tipping point. Um, the Yale's climate studies show that 29% of the population is alarmed about climate change, right? And another 20 some odd percent is very concerned. So we've already got 
over 50 or close to 50% of the population really, really ready to do something about climate change. So that to me seems like it's inevitable. And then there's the question, I can't remember who said this, um, you know, how does change happen? Very slowly at first and then all at once. And there's been a lot of slow incremental change going on. Um, I think of Otto Scharmer probably almost 10 years ago, I saw him at a, at a Heartland gathering and he was saying, you know, I'm working inside a Fortune 10 corporation. You know, it's a major financial services organization. And I had taught them to meditate. And one day I showed up and I just dove right into the work and said, wait, wait, Otto, we didn't meditate. We, we, we have to center ourselves before we begin this meeting. He said, this is unbelievable to me. In the 90s, that would have never, ever happened. And I was just in working for a, a large company last week in New York, $15 billion company leading, you know, working with some senior leadership there. And I taught them this tying breath to listening that I've, that I've, I've taken Otto's levels of listening and combined it with some practices on breathing. And, and people are like, oh, this is so cool. I want to, you know, when we came back from lunch, like, can we breathe? Can we breathe? So there's a hunger. There's a, there's a desire for more humanizing uh, ways of being together. And I think we, uh, yeah, Hemingway. Um, uh, thanks, Jerry. I, I can always count on Jerry or, or anybody in this group, just, you know, Pete. Yeah. Jerry and Pete are the two biggest ones. So there, there is, there's a, a, a huge shift in the ground that I think a lot of have not, a lot of people have not recognized that until something really brings it to their attention, they, they're not paying attention. And, um, I think we're probably a lot closer to some major shifts than we think. And at the same time, I, I have the schizophrenia going, oh my God, things are also way worse than, than we think they are, right? And which one of those, being in the bar, where do you direct your attention? Do you, Tom Atley famously said, things are getting better and better and worse and worse, faster and faster. So where do you put your energy? If you're on better and better, you sound like Pollyanna. If you're on worse and worse, you sound like Chicken Little. And if you're on faster and faster, you sound like a maniac. So where in that Venn diagram is the, the place to stand that allows you to be in the still point amidst all this swirl and take effective action? Um, go ahead, Wendy. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to reply to what Todd was saying and then Ken too. I really liked what you were saying, Todd, about you know stuff that's emerging, stuff that's coming from more of a... Of a other place or a spiritual place or a, and I, and I think that is what ends up creating the fast changes, right? The stuff that ends up being super organized takes time, right? And, and um, allowing things to be chaotic, allowing things to be a little more authentic, but raw around the edges, um, I think is a recipe right now that is working and that we need more of. Um, and so that's interesting, right? The signal for, hey, this is working isn't that it becomes organized, <laughs> that it becomes codified in some way. I think it's more that we're feeling the vibe of the growing energy and that is the validation. So, to, and then to your point, Ken, which I thought was a fabulous question about where do we put our time and energy? Do we put our time and energy and raising the alarm? Do we put our time and energy into figuring out what's working well? And from the research that I know about that you and I've talked about before, I think might apply here where it's less about each individual person and more about the community as a community and define community, however you want, as big or small as you want, there need to be people raising the alarm and there need to be people focused on what's working. And I would say, I would love a tipping point to be towards the what working, what's working well, because in general, when we focus too much on what's not working well, it, we just get depressed, <laughs> right? So there needs, and, and there's no hope there. There's just despair. And while we need to be aware of it, we need to have, right. And we can't be, it, to me, it's when you get only what's working well and visionary that you start going Pollyanna, right. And really that's not human. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've told each other and the story of our culture that when people sound all like, oh, it's going to be wonderful in the future. And there really is a place where this will all work out that we're like, oh, you're not science. You don't know what you're talking about because there's nothing grounded about that. <laughs> right? The grounded is the destruction and the, and the facts about the horribleness of stuff. But the truth is that's the stuff that there's plenty of stuff that is working. It's super grounded. And most of those people will tell you, oh no, the reason why this is working is because I'm paying attention to the problem, not in despite of, 
in spite of the problem, right? So to me, it's, it's I think that same concept applies not only to us as individuals, but in this, in this sense as communities that we need to keep that balance. And I think right now it's out of balance. And it's part of the reason why people aren't motivated to do something because they didn't, they never hear the, oh my God, there's so many people doing regenerative agriculture that is working. It was like, I just hearing that in the call in the video today. Thank you, please. I just need more of that as a starting point. Have you seen Biggest Little Farm? Fantastic documentary. I mean, oh, I, yes. I was blown away by how uplifted I was after watching that movie. I didn't expect it. I came away going, oh, this is so awesome. I mean, these people took over a plot of land that was basically dust. There was no nutrients in the soil. And clearly they had a lot of money because it didn't come cheap. But within seven years, they they brought that thing back to life in a huge way. And it, I think it's probably very much like the farm that Jerry was describing, where it would absorb water and, you know, it's all kinds of resilience and not without a lot of problems, which are right there, you know, shown in the movie. But at the end, I was cheering. I was like, oh, we need more of this. This should be every week. If we could have a dose of this every week, this would lift people up. So, right. And then, and then yeah. imagine there was a how-to guide, right? That from these farmers that said, not just the inspiring story, that's awesome. But then if I'm a farmer that wants to make this change, literally, how do I go about it? What are the pitfalls? What do I need to think about? Oh, that'd be amazing. I think there is actually, I think there's a, there's a companion guide to the biggest little farm of how to do this on your own, but apricot lean farms. Is that what that was, Jerry? Uh, that's what my brain tells me. Yeah. Um, Anyway, get hold of this this movie. If if you're anytime you're feeling down, watch this movie. You'll you'll be like, oh my god, this is what's possible. You know, you will and, you will cry, you will laugh, you will cheer, and you will just <laughs> better than love cats. every minute. Yes, you'll, laugh, you'll cry, and you'll and think very different. More Go interested ahead. in making sure that stuff gets to the people who have no hope, right? Yeah. I have plenty of sources that I go to for that kind of thing, and I will watch it and I will enjoy it. But I think like Stacy's made a comment too, like, how do we, you know, how do we get, so if I had a huge point of feedback for, for, um, the week, it would be, I, I think a repository of some variety, even again, even if it's a little chaotic, even if it's a little, whatever would be, would be lovely, both on the side of the alarm. Here's where the science, what the science is telling us for people who want to really dig into it. Um, and then also on the side of here, are all the great things that are happening. I, I, even if it was just a list of what they have already mentioned, they right? Could actually point to, they could point to other collections. They don't have to build their own collection, but they yeah. could point to a series of collections, right? Because uh, if you want climate data, go talk to Mark Trexler, who has been collecting mm -hmm. it assiduously for a very long time and organizing it. And he's got a very good start, right? And then if you want a list of nonprofits doing interesting work, uh, Vincent's busy building a, a, a thing, but there's a bunch of others that also have listings like that. Um, then, then we need more people with points of view about, hey, if you like this and feel like this and go, then try this and this, right? I think, I think we need a lot more people who are guiding everyone through the thicket. Um, one thing I wanted to just add to the conversation was the yogic concept of drishti which is in April's book about flux, which is about how to, how to have a mindset that lets you deal with constant change. And when you're doing like a one-legged pose in, uh, in yoga and need to balance a lot, you pick a spot someplace and that becomes your spot of focus. And that's your drishti. Uh, and it helps you balance because that spot is in, it's sort of immobile relative to where you are standing. Um, and you know, you can, you can be in motion, you can be in lots of different places, but finding a drishti of some sort is like finding an anchor in, in stormy seas or, or something. It gives, it gives you a mooring or it gives you a reference or whatever, whatever works for you. But it's a, it's a nice way to think about what is our sort of drishti as social things change, as environments change, as events unfold. By the way, a little plug for April. She's going to be uh, on a Barrett Kohler um, webinar Wednesday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Um, I will send uh, the link out. You're not aware of that, Jerry? Or you... Nice. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I've forgotten. Ken, but... Ken is April's publicist now. <laughs> sure. Awesome. Just a fan. Just a fan. And um, awesome. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send that out to the OGM list for, for people to um, sign up if they want. Um, I wanna... Thank you. It's a great idea. I, I, I want to try an experiment. Let's take a moment in silence and think about all the things that you liked about 
the, the week and type them into the chat um, and just don't hit return. Just, just, you know, type a bunch of them in there and then we'll, we'll do that little cascade where we'll all do it at once. And we'll do the, I wish thing. And then the, I wonder, and just see what we can collect for, for feedback that we can pass on to them. So that's not like a, a reasonable thing to do. You guys want to play along with me? Okay. Yeah. So are we doing them one at a time? So we wanted, yeah. it was first we'll start with, I like, and I'll say, go ahead, you know, let me know when you're ready. Just give a thumbs up or something. So I'll just type what I liked. Okay. Or I liked. So don't hit return until. Don't hit return until, until I say. I've got a few, I could probably think of more. Do people need more time? Are you ready to hit return? Okay, hit return. Okay. Oh. Cool.
Okay, people ready? Everybody ready? Need more time? Stacy, you're right? Good. Okay, hit return. Cool. I love what reading you. the last one? <laughs> I want to start on the next question. What was the last one? I wonder. Oh, thank I you. I wonder if. <laughs> you just evoked Dion and the Belmonts. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, why, wonder why, 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 why? <laughs> who wrote the book of life? <laughs> More time or are you ready? Hey, one more second. Or though you take, can do it. I, take I take your time. It. Take your time. We we not in a hurry. Well, Stuart jumped the gun and hit enter. I did. All right. I did. Mm -hmm. Should we go for it? Go for it. Sure. Pretty damn good collection. I will paste good idea, this. Mr. Homer. Yeah, good idea. I will paste this chat into the thought when I post it, etc., and then yeah. I'll send it to everybody separately as an attachment. I I would like to um, go back to something Stacy said that I think is really brilliant and important. And it's that phrase, what if this is working? Because if the filmmakers were to come in trying to convince us that it is working, that would create a reactive state. A lot of people would doubt it, but the taking the position that this may be working or imaginative, what if this is working, um, we're so used to catalyzing action through fear, but in a state of fear, we cannot be creative. And so we need creativity. And so we have, and, and that's part of the reason I think of the, they're taking the you is they start off with the stuff that could provoke fear 
and then moving into hope where you can be creative. Um, but I would love to see across the board more acknowledgements that there is a lot more amazing things happening than we're probably aware of. Those are not the stories that circulate. Love that, Todd. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Stuart. Just quickly, um, yeah, Todd, you hit on something so important um, th that I realized. You know, we 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 in this collective talked about heavy things with a lightness and an intelligence, and that just enabled you know some clear thinking um, to to bubble up. Um, and, and that could be an important piece of, of, a, of, of modeling um, or suggestion um, as this expands, you know, a how to, a uh, little bit of a how to engage in these conversations. Or maybe not, maybe, you know, people do it the way they do it. I just, yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of good stuff there. Todd, did you want to jump back in on that? No, no, I was just typing okay. an um, additional so thought in the chat. So uh, one of my amateur observations about history is that the winners were always, always losing until they won by a hair's breadth. And then even when it looks like they won, they always think they're about to lose power or the, the win. It's like, it's like we look back and we see the winners of history, but, but they just barely won often. Really seldom is there a complete wipeout. And there are wipeouts, but, but that just doesn't happen that often. And winners are always completely paranoid about losing, uh, you know, their their ability to to hold on to power or whatever else it is. And and winning has different meanings depending on what your attitudes are towards power, force, etc. Um, but you know, if a couple things had gone a little differently, there's a whole genre called alternative history, which is you know, what if the Nazis had won World War II? leads to a whole whole storm of fiction that you can sort of go go live in. There's a book called uh, The Years of Rice and Salt by Kim Stanley Robinson, where the, the, the basically the opening proposition, which you discover after a, a chapter in, is that what if the bubonic plague, instead of having like a 20% fatality rate, I don't remember exactly what it was, what if it had had like a 100% fatality rate? And what if Europe and Christianity and all of its associated things had just been wiped out? And so at the, beginning of that the, world. <laughs> at, the, at the beginning of the years of rice and salt, there's some Mongolian scouts who come through a forest into Western Europe where they hear that there were you know, some bad, terrible things happened and they discover like an abandoned wasteland. Um, so that the alternative future there is like, well, then you have Islam and you have Asia and like, like ooh, Native American tribes are still kind of around. Colonial era didn't happen. Oh, ooh, ooh, interesting stuff. This is this is just just a great example of, of, of our brainwashing. When you started that um, that that thread, Jerry, m immediately my mind went to the Super Bowl. You know, <laughs> people are losing until all of a sudden they're winning. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just to go back to what if questions for a minute. When I when I joined the World Cafe in nineteen ninety seven. We had on our website a series of what if questions. What if the future is born in webs of conversation, you know? And what if conversation actually is the way that work gets done? And, you know, instead of making declarative statements, taking a declarative statement and inverting it into a what if question allows for an invitation to explore as opposed to something to push back against. And I think this is really important. Um, I'm noticing a theme in, in my reading and research of late where it's, it's really about surrendering your ego and need to be right in service of how can, uh, how can we support the whole in arriving at a better uh, decision? How can we support good decision-making processes? And when, as soon as ego enters into it, it really tends to derail it. And I think ego and identity are really tied together, which is why as soon as you bring in Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, blah, 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 collective intelligence tanks. And as, as long as you can stay in, we're together and we need to figure out how to be together in the future so that our children and grandchildren and next generations are successful, then people want to you know, um, contribute to that conversation. 
and uh, it's it's just so important to to figure out how what's required in terms of development and emotional maturity for me to show up in a group and not feel the need to dominate and not feel that I have to be the person with the right um, perspective. And, you know, I know in my own life, it, it just took getting hit in the head a few million times with baseball bats to recognize that I'll never be the smartest guy in the room, you know, and there's always somebody smarter than me. There's always somebody with a better, stronger opinion. And, and if I can back down from that and just go, great, what's useful here? You know, the coaching school I went to is founded on three philosophical principles. The first principle or first school philosophy is, is summed up in the question of what's going on here, which is uh, phenomenology. The second question is, how do we know hermeneutics? And the third question is, therefore, what's useful, which is pragmatism. So what's going on? How do we know? And therefore, what's useful become really potent questions to ask um, to say, OK, you know, what's we, we collectively agree that what's going on is the seas are rising because my dock is underwater, you know, and the climate's changing because we're having all these droughts and floods and, and things. And what's useful, therefore, is to recognize we need to back down the, the, the warming trends. We need to, you know, suck carbon out of the atmosphere. And, and so let's get to work on that. Yeah. One, one thing that I just wanted to mention quickly, the word hope uh, comes up periodically. And um, just one thing that I've learned is um, hope requires action. Or hope without hope without action is just uh, silly, in, in 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 some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, Stacy, uh, you you were about to say something. Yeah, to, going back to what Ken was saying. Um, so today I posted um, a video that Anna Smith Smithson and Jean Houston they just started a podcast, Future Humans, and I put it in one of the um, emerging meta emails as well. But um, so they're interviewing Mariana Bosman. And at the end, they asked her, so with these people, you know, what kind of people, what kind of architects do we need to get together to build, you know, this new reality that we're hoping for? And her answer was, we need not narcissists. Like that, that was the whole answer. <laughs> and that's really important. And we need to recognize that we're all narcissists, you know. And that uh, was the other part of what she said. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I once heard Hamid Ali speak, and believe me, it was one of the most boring things I'd ever heard. This is the guy who, who founded the Diamond Heart, is also known as A.H. Almas. And he speaks in a monotone with an accent and very dense. But he did ask a really interesting question. He said, all right, I want you all to go outside on the lawn and cluster in groups of four or five. And you're going to answer one question. And you're going to spend 20 minutes answering this question. And the question is, where do you shop for your narcissistic supplies? And I just loved that question. You know? And right here is one place that I shop for my narcissistic supplies. I get accolades and acknowledgement and validation, you know, for my brilliance. And, um, you know, it's, it's a way for me to indulge my narcissism. And at the same time, it's a way for me to indulge my humility because there are people in this group and, and the larger OGM community who will always come up with things that make me think, wow, I hadn't thought of that. Thank you. That's really, you know, that's so good. Thank you. Thank you. So it's both the narcissism and the humility that go hand in hand. And I'm trying to up level the humility and down level the narcissism and it's not easy <laughs> yeah, what, she, what she actually said is or at least people that can recognize and moderate their own narcissism because we all have it <laughs> <laughs> narcissists are us right <laughs> well we have about five minutes left um any closing thoughts um, that you'd like to share <laughs> um lalu at all seem to be serious about hey send us your videos oh 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 um everybody needs to smile we need to take a sc uh, screen uh cap uh because they want that as well so uh, all ready to smile hold on i'm gonna hold the <laughs> ready are you smiling really ready here it goes <laughs> nice um good so I'll, I'll include that uh when i send it back to you guys um are you all okay if i if we send them all three videos so if they decide they want to go deep with us they can they can look i'd be happy to send that along yeah. oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah i'm not embarrassed by anything i said 
I think probably this last one is the best, you know, in terms of real feedback for them, but yeah. Yeah. I, I would also be happy to offer up, like if they're, I don't know what they're thinking of in terms of their next phase, but if like the tapestry trove weaving community project is something that they think their community could benefit from, then it'd be something I think that Vince and I speak for him <laughs> for just a second. I'm sure he'd be okay with that. would be happy to have a conversation around um, since it looks like what's coming our way is quite a few different communities that are looking to provide a platform where everything's curated, viewed, and then shared. And right. So a lot of those components, if that's what they're looking for, no need to create it anew is my first point. And secondly, if they found some value in talking to us, then I'm, we'd be open to a conversation for sure. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for making my dream come true. <laughs> it was hey, that easy. What dream is this? The dream that something might be catalyzed out of this, that it might lead oh. to some further connection. Yeah, I mean, that for, for us, I mean, this is what I'm working on anyway. So it's really just, does it right. align? Does it not align? Is the timing right? Is it, you know, and no hard feelings if it's, they come and they talk to us and it inspires a bunch of stuff and they think there's a better platform. Like it doesn't matter, right? The point is to have the conversations and to learn from each other about what's possible and then decide for ourselves where to go next. So, um, you know, we're two people, we're not an army and we don't have, you know, a bunch of people at our disposal. So it's, it's also about um, things taking their time as well. So speed or timelines can, can change things as, you know, change decisions the, as well. Yeah, and the point is, since we don't have the technology yet, this is how it gets done. One person yeah. at a time. One person yep. at a time, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and where Vincent's, I would really give him a lot of the credit where he's really going with it um, so quickly for a lot of, a lot of organizations is really going to be a great opportunity for um, that knowledge repository in a way that people can really benefit from it. It's not quite there yet. My experience, uh, I'm using it, but it's close and his thinking is so aligned. The background on what he's doing is so um, aligned with where everything is going that when he gets the front end up to speed with that, it's, you know, I see a lot of potential for it to serve a lot of communities in a lot of ways. It's really going to be great. Very cool. I need to learn more about this. I'll reach out to you, Wendy. Yeah, sure. I'd love to connect with you, Todd, and hear more about what you're doing too. Yeah, this has been, Ken, thank you for um, gathering us, facilitating this, uh, putting it together. Um, Jerry, thank you for, you know, um, everything in the chat and, and, and sharing the brain. Um, yeah, I have a poem if anyone wants to listen. Today's poem, okay? Can, can you hold on for that minute, Stuart? Let's close with that. I just want to get other people's closing sure. thoughts before we... Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and, and the last thing was, um, no, never mind, forget it. Mm -hmm. Forget that thought. Mm -hmm. Any other reflections before we close out? I have a question. Do we want to take any next steps? Like, this was so much fun. Let's find something mm -hmm. once a month to watch and then debrief or just let this dissolve into figure out what else comes after it when it arises. Um, Stacy just put the other video into the ODM conversation in a similar format, roughly. It's like, hey, the, everybody watch this. Let's have a pop-up call around it, which we could do. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm torn because uh, even at, I right. can't listen any faster than 1.25x. So there's an hour and then there's our conversation and then there's debrief. Every one of these things eats like, two and a half hours or something like that. Uh, and that's hard because- I get it. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. I, I sense something is gonna be born and it may not be born in this minute. Okay. Well, yeah. I wanna thank each of you for playing along with me. I really appreciate the, uh, uh, I know it's it's a lot. I mean, I asked you to commit to um, 
four and a half and three, seven and a half, almost a full day, eight hours, basically. You know, that's a this big morning, chunk of time. This morning, I thought it was going to be nine hours because I know I did too. It was two hours. I'm like, wait, I yeah. was not planning on this. And and see, every time I send an email out to the group, you come back bounced. It won't, it thinks I'm spamming you. So you never see me, Stuart yeah. saying, no, it's actually only one hour. It's mislabeled. But um, yeah. Canopy Gap's not happy with us. Yeah. Yeah. We're, so we're, we're working on that. It's Elliot's fault. It's a hover issue. <laughs> oh, interesting. I'm, okay. I'm glad we have somebody to blame. Um, so I just want to thank you all. It's been great fun. And I've really enjoyed, you know, uh, deepening the relationship with each of you. And I look forward to more. And, you know, come hang out with Stuart and me on Society 2045. Because, um, you know, we got, I, I've got some very interesting people coming up to be interviewed, including Todd and uh, Wendy and Pete. Um, so and Jerry, you're you're you know you have an open invitation. Um, Drop the link in or tell us when. I would okay. love to show up. Okay, great. Um, I did send it out to the OGM list, but I know you can't always read everything on there, so uh, I will send you individual links. Stuart, your closing poem, please, sir. Right. So so as I read this poem, and it's today's poem, it's called Compassion, but it really is about um, I think um, the mindset that we need to bring to these conversations going forward, especially in thinking about people who are pushing back, resisting, um, aren't on the bandwagon. Deep inside, under presence, fundamental human essence, beneath surface, beyond reason, emergent response to treason. Rage, a memory, primordial fear, terror of birth, injustice here, Rises up if crossed or burned, violations pleading spurned. Reactivity rips things apart, contrast a compassionate heart. Forego devilish blood revenge or risk suffering spriteful edge. Use intensity, grow a stronger heart, accelerate the human art. Reservoir of this powerful force, energy from a profound source. Trespass poisons a compassionate soul, violate them, makes you less whole. Beckon caring, love sweetness more, your soul births what you came for. See betrayers needing your love, needing warmth, not a shove. Respond in compassion, not vitriol, hate. Ticket through an evolutionary gate. <laughs> That's original. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of three hundred and sixty-five. Stacy, <laughs> they're up on a website called pilgrimspath.life. Pilgrimspath.life. Well, mm -hmm. Pete was looking for original poems for the plex, <laughs> so now I know where to go next week. Absolutely. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you for contributing. Thank you, everybody. It's great to see you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. I uh, really appreciate the time we spent together here. Same here. See you soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.